culturally speaking, during the Taisho period, um, we see, just like in the Edo period, this revival of a popular culture in Japan. And um, the youth, for the first time in Japanese history probably, are um, very vibrant and bringing at the forefront of this cultural renaissance per se. So in the big cities, um, young, ki- you know, young people, they love Western culture, Western habits. They want to be as Western as possible, just like Japan today, really. And so, you know, this is when you see people start to smoke cigarettes for the first time in Japan. Um, and we call the young men and women of this period uh, Mobo, modern boy, and Moga, modern girl. So this is kind of um, an example of Japan's fashionable youth of the Roaring Twenties. They were very interested in expressing themselves. So, you know, the mobo, the guys, they would wear this very slick black hairdo with gel, you know, and sunglasses with their cigarettes. And then the moga, the girls, they would wear Western style dresses generally. Although you would see them in chic kimono sometimes. You would see makeup, perms, lipstick. So, you know, they were very influenced by the West. That was their way of expressing themselves. So, you know, after Tokyo was rebuilt following the earthquake of 1923, the city was modeled alongside Western capital cities like Paris, London, New York, even though that's not a capital, but, you know, big cities of the West. Um, So you see cinemas built, restaurants, bars, outdoor cafes where people could sit and people watch. So, you know, this is where the Mobo and Moga would hang out. And so just like in the Edo period, we see that peacetime when there's no war and the economy is good. Popular culture develops, and that's where it's best fostered. In the Taisho period, we see that American baseball enters Japan for the first time, and it becomes a national sport, uh, which it remains to this day. So we see that baseball enters Japan during the Taisho period. And um, tennis and golf uh, also comes in. They're less popular. You know, nobody can beat baseball, of course. Literary works during the late Meiji period, and especially during the Taisho period, um, really, really blossom. And remember that uh, you know Meiji period in the early Meiji period, Japanese literature wasn't really doing well. But in the second half of the Meiji period, and especially during the Taisho period, Japanese literature kind of experiences this golden age. So we're going to go through some famous authors. Uh, one of them was Mori Ogai, who was a, uh, he used to be a doctor. He studied at Tokyo Imperial University, and then he went to Germany to study abroad. But he became very, very fascinated with literature. So he wrote this book called The Dancing Girl. Um, it's, about, it's a story about a Japanese man who goes to Germany and uh, to study abroad, just like he did, and falls in love with a German girl. But then he realizes he needs to you know, come back to Japan and, and live his life and, 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 and work for his country. So he goes, comes back to Japan and becomes very miserable taking a government job. So it might be about Mori's own life or inspired by the events anyway. A very good book. Shimazaki Toson is a, another uh, author of the late Meiji and early Taisho periods. He was Christian and uh, he was of the naturalist school of literature. And his book, I highly recommend is called The Broken Commandment. Okay, it was published in 1906. It's about the burakumin, the non-people class that has existed since really before the Edo period. Remember, butchers, grave diggers, anyone associated with death were ostracized from society. So in this book, uh, the main character is from a burakumin family. So he, his father tells him, you know, I want you to go out into the world, but don't tell anyone that you're from this family because you'll be ostracized from society. So he listens to his dad. He goes out in the world and becomes a teacher. He has a great career, but, you know, he feels constantly like he's hiding something. And so at the end of the book, he reveals his career to the world, and um, he, has, he ends up losing his career, but at the expense of his own honesty. So it's a very dramatic book. Um, Tayama Katai is another naturalist author. He wrote his autobiography in 1907 called The Quilt. Not, you know, not a very famous work. Nagai Kafu is another author. He actually stayed abroad in the United States and in France for five years between 1903 to 1908. His classic work is called The River Sumida, which is this river that runs through Tokyo. It was written in 1909. It's about a boy in Tokyo who, interestingly enough, 
you know, very different from the rest of, of Japan at that time. He prefers traditional performing arts of kabuki and haiku instead of business. So it's a very interesting juxtaposition. One of the greatest, uh, out of two, okay, two of them, but one of the greatest authors of the Meiji and Taisho eras is Tanizaki Junichiro, one of my favorites. Um, he talked about how the Japanese had to basically juggle between their values and their modern culture. So, you know, um, he talks about how traditional Japanese live in this modern world, but need to constantly be worrying about mixing between their own lives, their own culture, and Western culture. So he writes one of his classic books is called The Makioka Sisters, highly recommended, um, about a traditional Japanese family who, you know, is from the aristocratic class, but they lose everything, and they're trying to survive in this new Western world. If you want to start off writing you know, reading Japanese literature, I recommend Natsume Soseki. He is the most famous novelist of the Meiji and Taisho eras. And he's known as the Mark Twain of Japan because his books are very similar um, in nature to Mark Twain's. So um, he studied in Britain. He was very, very fluent in English. And, and, and his books are, have that British style of humor. Um, and his stories are about how people acted in the modern era. So, you know, he kind of, it's almost like satire about how, you know, you have these people who are trying to be westernized, but they don't really know what they're talking about. It's, you know, funny book, books. I recommend Bochan, very good. I Am a Cat is good. It's a, actually a critique of the Meiji period from a cat's point of view. So the entire book is written uh, as a cat. <laughs> from The narrator is the cat. So very entertaining. It's a satire of how silly people are and how they put on airs. Kokoro is another good book that I recommend. Natsume Soseki, if you want to get a good start to Japanese literature, I highly recommend his books. And all of them have been translated into English. Uh, Akutagawa Ryunosuke is uh, another very good short story writer, and he published over 150 of them. And uh, he's famous for taking old literature, old stories, ancient stories, and rewriting them with modern plots, modern twists, modern characters, like Rashomon. Maybe you've heard of it. That's thanks to Akutagawa Ryunosuke. He commits suicide in 1927 after a bout of depression. He was addicted to sleeping pills, and he commits suicide uh, right after the Taisho period ends. Painting is very, you know, comes back to Japan during the Taisho period. Uh, many painters like Umehara Ryuzaburo devote their career to Western oil painting, like you see on the right. But others like Saika Kiteitoku and Yokoyama Taikan, they combine Western art with Japanese themes. Okay, so both Japanese and Western painting coexisted during this period, which is nice that the Japanese didn't lose. their traditional art. This is an example of a Japanese style motif, but with a Western twist. Entertainment is interesting because stage theater and musicals develop during the Taisho period, just like anywhere else in the world during the 1920s. And radio and cinema comes in during the Taisho period for the first time to Japan. So just like in the West, the first movies were silent. But interestingly enough, unlike Western silent movies, which had like a narration, uh, you know, text narration, uh, the Japanese silent movies had people in the theaters, in the cinemas, narrating the story as the movie was shown. So they would narrate it, it would, that, their voice clip would get recorded, and then that would be played whenever this movie was shown at any cinema in Japan. So you would hear, you would watch the movie and you would hear of a narration of these silent movies. So they're not really silent, but the sound wasn't embedded into the films. But as you enter the 1920s and early 1930s, um, movies with sound become common. And so for the first time you see um, movies about the samurai come about, romance stories about everyday people in the Taisho period. So it was just like today, there was a mix of Japanese cinema in terms of traditional themes. You see those a lot. And then you also see, you know, everyday movies, um, you know, old movies, just like the 20s movies of, you know, common people, romance, love, drama. And you can still see many of these movies on YouTube if you're curious about the cinema of the Taisho period. And um, a lot of them are very, very good.